you have your Bibles, turn with me once again to Romans chapter 8. This wonderful chapter in the writing of the Apostle Paul that brings us to the conclusion of some wonderful doctrine and teaching concerning our salvation by grace through faith and pushes us in the direction of living and application of truth. So this eighth chapter has been probably the favorite for many because of how we come to an awareness of what we have in salvation and uh, how we can enjoy the benefits of being saved, being his, that is being God's children. So in Romans chapter eight, we're continuing just this two message uh, series, many, many series, because I'm just bringing this over to the start of the new year and have a uh, pretty lengthy series for us on Wednesday night in the new year. So I'm looking forward to that. Romans chapter eight and uh, verse 28 is where we were last week. And the title of this just many, many series is uh, life beyond conversion. So I just want us to look at that. Before we read that, let me just bring to your attention the beginning of this chapter. As I said, kind of brings together some conclusion to the doctrine uh, that he had been teaching concerning salvation by grace and through faith. And uh, so in the beginning of the chapter, he introduces the benefit of being saved. And then he goes forward with the expectation that is what you should expect to see in the life of those who are saved. And then he makes this clear statement in Romans 8, 28, how God has planned the life of the saved and the future of the saved. It's very interesting. We'll look at that in uh, our New Year's service where I'll be preaching another, just one sermon, not attached to a series, but uh, in our New Year's sermon coming up this Sunday. So let's just look at a couple of verses, Romans chapter 8. And I just want to ask you a few questions and we'll go forward. Uh, back to where we were last week, 28 and following. In the very first verse, it says, There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is a major statement of the benefit of those who are saved. Because what we had in the writing of Paul and the doctrine and the teaching of Paul leading up to chapter 8 is just the, the certainty of the condemnation of everyone who attempts to live under the law of God. It is absolutely certain that everyone who makes attempt to be justified by the works of the law is going to be sadly disappointed and live under the sense of condemnation. We must understand that. It's so clear. And to come to this statement, which is a revelation, and not only a revelation, but a great text for celebration, when it says in the very first verse, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And in this scripture, we have such a drastic change that uh, we must pause to acknowledge what has happened to bring us to this verse in the teaching of Paul. Paul makes it very clear in the last couple of verses of chapter 7 that when he attempted to live under the law, and he did all of his life prior to knowing Jesus. He made every effort to live under the law and to be absolutely obedient. But as he confesses in chapter 7, when he thought he was doing well, he would find many reasons to know that he was not. When he thought he was pleasing God, he would find many verses that would prove he was nothing before God. So that he comes to the end of this struggle and says in verse 24 of chapter 7, O wretched man that I am. Now I want to say something to us before we go any further. Salvation is always a source of great joy 
to those who at one point in their life came to the awareness of the wretchedness of their condition before God. I have to say that if we think that salvation is nothing more than some decision that we make and now everything's okay and we never really saw our wretchedness, but it's just a decision that we make. If we never felt that we were in need of deliverance, if we never knew in our mind, in our heart that we were condemned and judged and forever separated from God. And that was our condition so much that we, like Paul, would cry out, oh, wretched man that I am. What we call this, of course, is conviction and what is missing in a lot of our presentations of the gospel is absolute, pointed teaching concerning the condition of the lost soul. And when we can point that out, and God by the Holy Spirit and through the Scriptures paints the picture of our condition without God, then the thing that comes next in the heart of man is conviction. So much so that he sees, as Paul saw in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, that he was a wretched man in need of help, in need of deliverance. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? And I think when we come back to pointing out what the law points out, the sinfulness of man, then people can see the picture. And God, by the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures, can bring conviction to their hearts. I can say in my experience of preaching now for 36 years, 37 going on, I've only seen a couple of occasions where someone ran to the front crying out for Christ to save them, their soul. Happened one time when I was in Jennings, Louisiana, and I told you the story before. Some of you are not here as members, and I told it before you came. I'll just briefly remind you of the morning that I was driving to church, and God told me not to preach what I had planned to preach. And it's always a very scary thing when God tells you to do that. That means before... I get to the church before I turn the key off and get out of the door. God must speak to me about what I'm supposed to do because he just told me what I was not supposed to do. And so my sermon notes just fell to the side on the seat and I'm saying, okay, God. And only one scripture came to my mind and that was you must be born again from John chapter three. That's all I had. I, I, re- I tell you the truth. That's the only word I had in my mind. I said, I sat on the platform in, in, in the church that I preached in at, you know, at that time. And as a matter of fact, just about all the churches except this church, I sat on the platform and looked out at the congregation before I stood to preach. And I stood there just praying the whole through every song, praying the song would be a little bit longer. And, you know, the prayer uh, that someone would pray would be longer and maybe it'd take longer collecting the offering and, Because all I had was, you must be born again. And it was one of those miracle moments where I stood to the pulpit and said, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 3. And then something just hit my heart about how the very words of Jesus to the heart of a man who thought he was a good man, who thought he was good enough to be a teacher, a ruler, one who could tell others what they needed to know about God, came to an awareness of his need of security concerning his soul. And when that just hit my heart and I began to realize I'm not supposed to just preach, you must be born again, but this is to a religious person in our congregation. And everything changed When I stood to preach that I want to preach to people today who think they're saved, but are not. And I have but one message to you. You must be born again. (laughs) Uh, And it's just amazing how it took the simple gospel, went point after point after point. And at the end of each point, I paused and said, you must be born again. And at the conclusion of that service, I was waiting to see why God had made this change in my preparation and what he had planned to do. 
And the best, listen to me, the best Sunday school teacher in our church for years jumped up and ran forward saying, I must be born again. That's what we need to see in our churches today. People who come to, at one point in their life, come to the awareness of the fact that without grace and without Christ, they are eternally doomed. Like Paul, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? And when he said in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that's who's going to deliver me. It's through Christ that I'll be delivered. So with the mind, I can still serve the law of God. I still have to know what God's word says. But with the flesh, I know that it's going to be sinful and needs to be under the grace of God all my life. So then he comes to verse 1 of 8. There is now no condemnation. Free. So I just want to say, as we're looking to life beyond conversion, we need to remember the joy of our salvation. The peace of the moment when we came to know Christ. It should never be something that's covered in the past as something that we can vaguely remember or seldom sense the joy of in our heart. It should be something that we're excited about at all times. So we understand that we were saved by grace through faith. And through faith in Jesus Christ, we came to deliverance and we came to life and we came to peace. And that's what Paul's talking about in the first part of Romans 8. Before we get to 28, there's so many verses that we should understand. So faith brought us to an experience of being free in Christ, being delivered from the bondage of sin, which, by the way, I just want to turn back and read a couple of verses to you that you should know. We're in eight, which assumes we've read five. I was reading with my grandchildren. This was something we did this week as a new thing. I don't know if it'll be a Christian I mean, a Christmas tradition, but we did it this Christmas. I pulled out of the series and said I have of John Owen's life work, one of the books, John Owen books. Now, I'm going to tell you about John Owen. I can read a whole paragraph of him and I have to read it again. I can read one sentence of John Owen and I have to read it again. So therefore, when I finish a John Owen book, I have read it probably 15 times because I had to read everything again and again and again. So I got my grandchildren, I, just a few of them, my uh, grandson, my oldest grandson, my oldest granddaughter, and sat around and said, we're going to read some of this book. Actually, I said, you're going to read some of this book. So I want you to read it, and uh, we're going to stop and talk about it, just a little bit of it. This will be our conversation. And uh, so I let my, in that family, my oldest son's children, his youngest son, read first. And he had a little problem with some of the words. But the very first word was, because we didn't start at the beginning of the chapter, and I thought how odd it would be to start a sermon like this. He said, sixthly. <laughs> would you like to start a sermon like that? Sixthly, which means uh, you don't have time for the first five points because we're, we're past all of that. Sixthly, that's John Owen. But anyway, he read the whole paragraph, and we read it again, and we read it. And then finally, I took the book from him and said, let me read it. So I read it again. We're no better off with that I reading it. We're all sitting there. What did he just say? The thing is, uh, what John Owen on this in this particular edition was speaking of the whole book all the way through is basically our dealing with sin, putting it away. And the Bible says, I'll just read it to you so that we could assume, by the way, sixthly assumes you've listened to one through five. So uh, eight assumes you've, you assumes you've read one through seven. So let's just turn back to Romans five just for a moment and listen to what he says. Chapter five, verse one. 
Therefore, having predestined, or having rather, having been justified, it's still innate, having been justified by faith, verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now let me just pause and say, if we're talking about life beyond conversion, we know what conversion is. It is being delivered. It is having peace where we had none. It is coming out from under the condemnation of the law. It's having life in Christ. It is, as it says here in five one. it is being justified, made just as if we've never sinned. And that by faith, having this peace with God through Christ, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice. Present tense, we, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, which we'll come back to in Romans 8. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. This life of freedom and liberty and grace and peace is also a life beyond conversion of trials and troubles and tribulations which serve a purpose. So last week I was telling you that life beyond conversion, our testimonies up to that point were testimonies of conversion. But what testimony do we have beyond conversion? Now that we know we have the life and the peace and the joy in Jesus and We've been justif- justified. What is the life beyond that? It is a life of rejoicing. Yes, it is. It is a life of glory of God in our life, rejoicing the hope of the glory of God, which we come to in Romans 8. But not only that, we glory in tribulations. A real Christian is not only a person who has come to be delivered from sin and the domination of sin, Romans 6, 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. It is living in a peaceful state during and through the experience of tribulations, which are inevitable in the life of a believer. So to preach to people you're saved, And life's going to be just wonderful, contradicts probably the most popular view of Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. It's going to be all good, and we don't expect anything bad to happen. But actually, Romans 8, 28 is not saying it's going to be all good and nothing bad is going to happen. It doesn't say that. For if we interpret it to say that, then we've missed Romans 5. For it says we glory in tribulations. All things work together for good, and we determined last week that good was to make us like Jesus, which was the purpose for which we've been called. Let's read this, let's quote the scripture all together. It says, For we know that all things work together for good to those who are the called, to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. So the called, who are free, who have peace, who have joy, who are not under condemnation, the called are called according to a purpose. And what is that purpose? Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. You were called to be made like Jesus. That's what we said last week. This week I'm saying to you part of that. Is not only enjoying the liberty and life you have in Christ, but is enduring the troubles and the tribulations that are inevitable to come into your life. And those things work together for good for the purpose of making you like Jesus. So that it's not that everything that happens to you, you would say it was good, but it is going to work together for good according to the purpose, which is to make you like Jesus. So the Bible says those tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character, hope. 
So you all know James chapter 1, right? What does it say in James chapter 1 about troubles and trials and tribulations? Consider it a what? Joy when you encounter such. And what's going to happen to a person who encounters such? You're going to become mature. It's exactly what the scripture says. Consider it a joy because this is the path to maturity. This is the path to becoming like Christ. That you'll be mature. You'll grow up in Jesus. And so pray for wisdom of how to maneuver and navigate through these trials so that the end result is to be like Jesus. The end result is to grow and to mature. So pray that your navigation through such things will be wise. Passing through trials and tribulations with the expectation of perseverance, with the expectation of character and hope. So by faith... We have accepted Jesus Christ. We've come to peace and life by faith. Through that experience, we come to have tribulations, but those are to be expected and never shunned. Think it not strange concerning the trials that come into your life. It's all part of the plan. And Jesus also said to his disciples, the servant's not greater than his Lord. The troubles that I've endured You'll endure also. If they heard my word, they'll hear yours. There'll be some who will hear. But the others will treat you as they've treated him. So we expect that as part of the life beyond conversion. Troubles and trials. And yes, we can come together and make prayer requests and say, pray for me. I'm going through this trouble and trial. I gave you an illustration of that already. And God wants the church to be edified and built up by going through trials together. Your trial is not to be your isolated island experience. It's to be an experience that the body can become part of through prayer and watch you become like Jesus as God guides you through that and navigates you through that. But it also encourages the church when we pray and edify, build up one another in our prayers together. We can't enjoy the life beyond conversion if we live it in isolation. It's not possible. It has to be in the body of Christ. It has to be that you have brothers and sisters that you love and they love you. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could say, I rejoice with those who rejoice and I weep with those who weep? That's life in Christ, in the body. So I just want to say to you that we have life, we have liberty, we have joy, we have trouble that has purpose to make us like Jesus. And I also want to say to you, then this is something, as I said just a moment ago in Romans, it says that sin shall not have dominion over you. We have the, we have the blessing of being able to live conquering sin, right? So I'm just going to say the, the, very quickly, listen, I'll not stay long here. I have a whole sermon coming up this Sunday that we'll look at the new year and how we can live it. But I do want to say to you that when you are really saved, truly saved, and the troubles and trials come into your life, and they will, and you begin to experience growth as you navigate through those by faith and prayer, prayers of the saints along with you, you also have to realize that you're living in this experience because you're His. And because you're His, you do not live with sin dominating you, your life. You live with the ability to conquer sin. For sin shall not have dominion over you, the Bible says. So if you've had a problem for a long time, it need not be. There's no need for you to think that you can't live with victory over your sin. There's no need for you to continue to live as though you're a slave to it as much as you were before you were saved. That's just not true. 
God has given you power to conquer. Sin shall not have dominion over you. And I want to say also, you shall not live in fear of death. You shall not live in fear of death. You know the things that plagued us before we were saved? The sin that dominated our life and we couldn't get loose. We were slaves to it. That's not your life anymore. You had troubles before you were saved, but you didn't have a Lord to turn to. You didn't have a body to encourage you, a body of believers, a family. You have so much today that will help you enjoy the life beyond conversion. And one thing that really is of great joy, and by the way, I have to say this to you tonight. This evening, Brother Ed... Passed away, Ivy, and I went and visited Brother Ed Ivy this evening before, earlier this evening, before his passing. Miss Margaret, as you know, is still having problems, and now other problems, and we need to pray for them, the Ivies. But I was thinking as we experience the passing of our loved ones who are believers, It doesn't mean that we don't grieve. We grieve. But we do not grieve as those who have no hope. There is a difference in our grief. Because there can be and should be a celebration in our grieving as well. We may not see them and have them tomorrow, but we know where they are. And Paul was very clear when he would say to us that, you know, I have before me the idea of whether I stay here or I go there. And it'll always be, if I stay here, it's only for your benefit. But for me, going there is the greatest benefit And that's what I long for. And it should be in the Christian's heart and life that what we long for is to go there. But until God says that's what's going to happen, we live here for the benefit of the body, enjoying the life beyond conversion. And for those who need to hear the gospel. It's hard for us to go through times like the Ivies will go through. Of course, we're talking about Pat Davis and Cindy Knuckles, the daughters. There's one other, Bobby. Shelly. I don't remember meeting Shelly. I'm sorry. Okay. Florida. So we need to pray for them. Just that God will allow them their grief in the context of their faith. But I'm so glad that I've been delivered I don't worry about, I'm not under the condemnation of the law. I'm free in Christ. I'm glad that I have, I have troubles and trials that have a purpose and a reason. That's to make me like Jesus. And all I have to do is get with some brothers and sisters who weep when I'm weeping and rejoice when I'm rejoicing and pray for me to get through this and navigate it in such a way by the direction of the Holy Spirit that on the other side of it, I'm more mature and I look more like Jesus. And that's what it's or actually all things are working together for that. And I'm so glad that I don't have to look at death as the final say so in my life. Death doesn't have any power over me. I like what Jesus said to Martha when he came four days late, according to some people. He had said, this sickness is not unto death, and Lazarus died. He gets there after Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. But this is what Jesus said to Martha. Martha, he who lives and believes in me never dies. Do you believe this? This is the peace that we have. A person who lives and believes in Jesus can never die. She said, well, I know he'll live again in the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He expected her to have a different response. 
And he expects us to have a different response to the departure of our beloved brothers and sisters who have lived with faith in Jesus. Our faith in Christ takes us out of death and into life, and we can never die. We can only move. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But pray for the Ivies that they'll be able to maneuver through this, and, and they'll be able to rejoice through this in the way that Christians should. We have the guarantee of victory. So then, let me make one final statement tonight, just tagging on to this many, many series, just this very short in context view of Paul's teaching in Romans. So we return to Romans 8 and I close with these words. We read last week Romans 8, 28, and I quoted it already. We know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the purpose right there. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And moreover, whom he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You should keep that in mind. Don't lose that in the transition of verse to verse. He also called and whom he called, he justified and whom he justified, he glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So listen to me carefully. This verse talks about those who love God and they only love him because he loved them first. And they only love him because he called them to himself. They only love him because they were placed in Christ. And in Christ, they were made free from sin. And in Christ, they were made free from the condemnation of the law. And in Christ... They were brought to a place where sin had no dominion over them. They did not fear anything, not even death, for death was not going to have victory over them. They had already passed from death to life. And what he was saying of the believers there, he's saying of believers today, it's just as true. It's just as real for you so that we have been called, predestined, and that is to be justified, free from sin, and ultimately to be glorified, to may, be made like Jesus, not only in a transitional way while we live beyond conversion here, but ultimately to see him and be as he is, to be made like Jesus. So we enter into, beyond justification, a calling and a life of sanctification, becoming like Jesus, transitionally, with a knowledge that when we see him, we will be as he is ultimately. But we live in this life becoming like Jesus. Now, with that in mind, life beyond conversion is all about becoming increasingly more like Jesus. Now, I'm going to read a quote to you that I just got fresh off the press just a moment ago. Boy, I saw this and I said, Lord, that is wonderful. I think I'm going to use that tonight. Quote, how many people set themselves to abide in Christ? Very few. To abide in Christ. When people do not abide in Christ, all the wonderful benefits of abiding never become theirs. They may be very earnest and have good motives, but they will have no fruit. Fruit only comes through abiding. End of quote, Joseph Carroll from the Evangelical Institute. And we have a representative here tonight. Is that not a powerful statement right there? What does that say to me? So many people are saved and may know that they are, but the life beyond conversion is unfruitful because they don't abide in Jesus with the intent of becoming more like the Christ they know. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. In other words, abiding in Jesus is an experience of working through life with the scripture and by the spirit 
to become more like Christ. And the more you abide, abide in Jesus and his word abides in you. And to me, it just goes both ways. It's that you can't be abiding in Jesus if you're not abiding in his word. And if you're abiding in his word, you can't help but abide in Jesus. Those two things go together. So what's for available to you and God's purpose beyond conversion, making you like Jesus, is you're abiding in him to have a fellowship that brings about the end result fruitfulness. More like Jesus. Isn't that an amazing thing? More like Jesus. So I'm going to just just ask you this brief question. And I know that annually, we do some things annually every year. I had tried this year. I hope and pray there was some benefit and blessing to it to get us to think about Christmas in a different way, to, to think that we should have some attitudes and some characters or characteristics at least uh, in our lives that help us to see Christmas in a different way. I don't know if, if you benefited from that any at all. I hope, I hope you did. But when we look into the new year, there's no doubt uh, everyone is going to make an attempt once again this year to take a Bible, and I'm going to read through it this year. This this will be it. I'm, I'm really going to do it this year. I mean, I'm going to go, I'm going to read through the Bible. Yeah, that's going to work just like you're not going to eat any more pie or cake. Or you know, we, we, we make these resolutions, but I'm going to ask you to do something different and not say, I'm going to read through the Bible, but say I'm dedicated to walking with Christ and having his word in my heart. Because I don't care if you read all the way through it. If his word's not in here, then all you did was check off something on the list of New Year's resolutions with no fruit and no benefit. But I'm going to walk with God and I want his word in here. And I'll just challenge you to read the Bible systematically. Don't just open the Bible and read whatever words you find in front of you. But if you start in a book, finish that book and read every day until until you know God said something to you and you need to stop. I don't care if you're in the middle of a, middle of a chapter when something captures your attention that's the time to stop. Read right there. That's the way it's ha- it happens with me. I'll be reading, and all of a sudden, I'll be in the middle of a chapter. I'll read something. It's like, wow, I never saw that. You know why I never saw it? Because I just saw it. Meaning that God's saying, stop. Think about this. Get this in your heart. There's something I want you to know here. Would you do that? And I believe you'll be guaranteed the victory that the Bible talks about in Romans chapter 8. You'll be more than a conqueror. You'll live with absolute knowledge that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Romans chapter 8, the whole, the rest of the chapter just becomes so real, vital to your life. I want to thank you so much that you came out on a rainy night to hear there's a life for us to live. And it's abiding in Jesus and being fruitful. Father, I thank you for your word. And thank you for blessing us to have it in our hand. And now we may we hold it in our thoughts. And may we receive it into our heart. So that we may be fruitful in our living, and others may see Christ in us. May we enjoy the life that you determined we should live beyond conversion. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Loving Christ, the media ministry of New Covenant Church of Denham Springs, Louisiana. If we can minister to you somehow, please call us at area code 225-664-0858. Until next time, get into the Word of God and stay there.
This has been a production of New Covenant Church, All Rights Reserved.